Hallelujah. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart and with praise. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. While you're standing, dear Heavenly Father, we praise you. We thank you for bringing us together tonight, God. Dear Heavenly Father, we are waiting a word from you, God, tonight, God. God, prepare their hearts, God. God, put it on my lips so I might present it in such a way that they can receive it, Father. It's your spirit, your spirit that speaks through me, God. And we know that you have a message today for God's people, and we thank you and praise you in advance. We pray for the life application thereof when we leave this place. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. You may have your seats. Praise the Lord. I think I need my glasses. If you brought your Bibles, turn with me to the sec to Second Corinthians, the 13th chapter, and I will start at verse 1 and go through 6, if you will. You know I like to hear the pages turning, so if you brought your Bibles, I'll be reading from the King James Version. And it starts out, this is the third time I am coming to you. In the month of two or three witnesses shall, in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. I told you before and foretell you as if I were present the second time and being absent now, I write to them which uh, herefore to have sinned and to all other that if I came again, I will not spare. Since you seek a proof of Christ speaking in me, which to you word is not weak, but is mighty in you. For though he was crucified through weakness, yet he liveth by the power of God, for we are also weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God towards you. Examine yourselves. Whether you be in the faith, prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates. But I trust that ye shall know that we are not reprobates. And let everybody say amen. amen. For a title of tonight's message, I'd like to say, watch your lane. Watch your lane. Watch your lane. And you can kind of tell by the tone that Paul had here that it's kind of like a, a parent saying, just one more again, just one more again. And you know, when, when they told me I was ministering, I, I had a tiptoe through your tulips. I had an Abba Father follow on. I had a real fun message. And then he laid this on me, watch your lane. And I said, God, I don't, I don't want to minister this because it's not fun. Like, I'm not looking forward to ministering this. So if you just bear with me and just let me talk to you tonight. All right. Watch your lane. We're just going to have a conversation. And I, and, and I think he picked me because I'm just bold enough to tell it. Because this isn't what I, I want to preach, so just bear with me. It's all going to come together, believe you. It's a faith refresher. It's, it's really all going to fall in line if you just give me time to preach it. So watch your lane. So I am mad in, in a righteousness indignation kind of way, a Psalms 4, 4 mad, like I'm mad. Because even though it is finished, I'm looking to my left and to my right, and I'm looking all around, and everything is backwards to the point where I am upset with the state of our nation. Our nation has an identity crisis. And although we win and it's finished, we got to deal with it, and we got to deal with it now because what happened was while we were asleep, the sower came in, and we had sowed our seed, right? And then we went to sleep, and now there's weeds in the wheat. There's weeds in the wheat. And so we got to deal with that. And I remember, I remember uh, it was August 2nd of 2018. We had a teen night. It was in this building. We had a DJ up here. And Minister Travis and uh, Benford, Minister Stelmacher were, were preaching back there. And, and uh, Pastor had the mic. And he said, parents, how do you show your love to your children? And Willem's hand was up, 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 up. He wanted to an answer, but Zayvon was right there. They gave the mic to somebody over here first, and she got it wrong. And pastor said, now nah, sit down. And Zayvon said, through discipline, through accountability. And pastor said, that's exactly right. Gave him $5. Chrissy went back there. And 
Archie went back there, and, and that was the right answer. And I, I'm thinking like, if we would handle our business in the high chair, we would have no need of the electric chair. <laughs> like, this is, this is where it starts, right? Yeah. And so that sort of insight, and I know Willem would have gotten it right, but our society is, I, like, I can't stand to watch the news, and I don't want to be critical while I'm up here, man. Believe me, the issues that I'm going to talk about, I was the first partaker of the message. I'm going to be very transparent with you. I'm going to tell you where I went wrong, and then we're all going to take a breath. We're going to watch our lane. We're going to get introspective. We're going to take an inventory, and believe me, I'll give you a, witness te uh, a litmus test biblically on how you can watch your lane. Is that fair? Is that fair? A lot of what I'm going to tell you is I believe I got it from Leds, right? And I was listening to uh, Minister Jones preach. It must have been two weeks ago Wednesday, and he said that after his Leds class, pastor shut them down. And then I was reminded of my class. I was like, Doc, shut us down. I mean, this is before COVID. When my class graduated, that was it. There will be no more LEDs. I'm not going to tell you who, who is in my class. I'm not going to tell you why, but shut it down. But anyway, a lot about what I'm, I'm going to talk to you about comes from Christian philosophy. And the new name of the class was Kingdom Culture, right? And so in this class, we kind of are given precedent, and she talks about a lot of other stuff, and, you know, I'm, you know, this gender dysphoria thing, I'm going to talk about it because it's, it, 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 it's, it's gone a little bit too far, and again, it's happened while we slept. You know, they are giving our children drugs, prepubescent, before they even go through puberty to say, if I feel like I'm a girl, they're going to stop my testosterone. They're going to, if you're a female, they're going to stop your, and this is before the age of consent. It's time out. We're going too far. This is it. I mean, you've got, I mean, this is for Gia, right? Do you want Gia going to the bathroom with a boy in the bathroom? Do you want Kehlani participating in sports where there's a six foot four man that's winning the competition, taking the money, taking the prestige, and it's a man versus a girl? I don't mean to get political, but we, we've gone too far. This is it. I look to my left and I look to my right, and I'm fed up with it. And we, are, you know, my con I live in a condo, and the association's methodology is like this. You take care of the drywall in, we take care of the drywall out, right? <laughs> Why when there's a problem in my driveway do you call me and I got to fix it? But nevertheless, we as a church, as a body of believers, we're wor worried about the drywall in. We got the 7M all messed up. It's about the drywall out. That's where the fight is. And we're losing. I know it's not a great message. I know. But we could take it back if we watch our lane. We could take it back if we watch our lane. And I, there, there's this book. Bear with me now. There's this book called Freakonomics, right? I rarely will tell you to read any books that's outside of the Bible. But there's a book about Freakonomics, and it's two economists, right? I believe his name is Steve Levitt and Stephen uh, Dubner. And what the book does is it takes economists that are metrics data driven and they make sometimes irrational conclusions about things that wouldn't make ordinarily make sense, right? So as an example, and I'm not saying I agree with this, but there was a sharp decline of crime in New York in the early 90s. And it would be easy for society to say it was Clinton's laws or gun laws, and therefore there was a decline in crime. Well, they say, hey, not so fast. What that really was was Roe v. Wade back in the day, and those people that were aborted would have grown up in poverty, impoverished, and they would have committed crimes, and that's the reason why there was a decrease in crime. Do you see where I'm going? Like, I'm not saying I agree with it. I'm just saying they draw conclusions based off of data, right? Same thing with sumo wrestling. They say that once a sumo wrestler comes to a certain record, they start purposefully losing 
because it sets the agenda and it sets the stage for different hierarchies, monies, and all. So they draw these conclusions, sometimes irrational, sometimes not, but I'm, I'm going somewhere with this. And I, I could go on and on and on about it, but, but here's my submission to the next book of Freakonomics. Because I believe that we lost out and the current generation is where we are, and we find ourselves asleep because of taking prayer out of schools back in the 60s. That's my Freakonomics. That's, my, that's what I'm saying is they took prayer out of school, and that's why our kids are surrounded in that environment that they're in. They took prayer out of school. And I think there's some case precedence in this that, that Dr. Moss taught in, uh, if you don't know what LEDs is, Leadership Education Development School. And I don't know if this was a case, but there's a case in 1962, and it, ha it was in New York, and it was uh, Engel versus Vitale, right, 1962. And the Board of Regents in 1950, 51-ish, somewhere in there, came up with a prayer that they were going to say in school. And it was a simple 22-word prayer, something along the lines of, Almighty God, we acknowledge our dependence on thee. We beg of your blessings for us, for our parents, for our teachers, and for our country. And that was it. They could have opted in. They could have opted out. But that was the prayer, and they said it after the Pledge of Allegiance, right? We, they used to always say it in school, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic of which I stand, one nation, <laughs> under God, individual, <laughs> right? They added God in 1954, because if you'll remember, there was a Cold War. It was communist-driven, and the communists were atheists, so they added under God, so all good, right? Start the day, Pledge of Allegiance, get the prayer out of the way. Well, Engel obviously had a problem with it. So he took it to the, to the court, and what was, what was at stake here was the First Amendment, right? The Establishment Clause of the First Amendment, and then, you know, we get really into the weeds about the Establishment Clause, and Congress shall not put the wall up between state and religion, but the 14th Amendment covered the state, so the states were in. But nevertheless, somebody cried about it, brought the case, the Supreme Court heard it, and they agreed that it was against the First Amendment, and that was it. That was a wrap. That was a wrap, just like that. And it was a vote of six to one, I want to say, and there was an you know, opinion, then there was a dissent. The dissent was Potter Stewart. I think we should know these things. The dissent was Potter Stewart. The reason why I know that is because in 1963, there was another case. So we got rid of the prayer in school. And then in 1963, you got another case. This was in Pennsylvania. And uh, I believe the, pri the primary was Shemp, I want to say. Uh, so it was, it was the, the state against, uh, the Shemp against state, but the wording was uh, turned backwards when it went back to the Supreme Court. But anyway, it would, they use a precedent of the 62 case in the 63 case, and in the 63 case, they were saying 10 Bible verses in the morning at school, and then they were saying the Lord's Prayer, right? And so same thing, went all the way up to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court acknowledged that it was against the First Amendment Established Clause, and they took it out. So you want to know what happened while we were sleeping? This is what happened. And can I be the first to tell you? Can I be the first to be transparent? Can we just talk here tonight? Can we just I've never told another, another human being this in my entire life. I know, I know this, is, this, this might not be a fun night. But I'm, I'm going to admit it. I wanted Kamala Harris to win. I didn't care what she stood for. I didn't care what she was all about. I wanted her to win, and that was my vote. That was it. That was my vote. I'm not saying right, wrong, or indifferent. I'm just saying that's what I did. What I'm, what I'm saying, same thing with Obama. That was, that, I didn't care. I compromised the word of God because of a political ideology and an agenda. But I'm saying in 2024, we vote Jesus. 
in 2024, we vote for Jesus, right? So that, that's, my, that's my transparent part, uh, you know, of tonight. But it's gone too far, guys. It's really gone too far. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so God is provoking us tonight to watch our lane. And, I, you know, I'm going to help us with that. So I was in the military. I'm retired military. And one of the things that we used to have to do every year is qualify on our weapon. My personal weapon was an M16A1 rifle. And we used to have to qualify on it. And you don't just grab a gun, go out to the range, fire it, and go on home. It was a process, right? So you get out to the range, you go out there in a cattle truck, it's all hot and sweaty with all these people, and then you sit and wait and wait and wait and wait, and you hurry up to wait, and you finally get out there, and range control takes over you, and they march you out like your cattle, and you get out there, you get everything set. First of all, when you get your own weapon, when you get your weapon, you have to zero it first, right? You could, get, you could take a weapon and you could have perfect aim downrange and miss. Not even get on, on your target, you could miss. So the first thing you had to do was zero your weapon. And, and, and I'll, I'll get to this procedure, but to zero your weapon, the first thing you would do is you'd shoot three, or five, three to five shots, look at your shot group, and then you'd make adjustments, right? This is kind of what Chrissy talks about with calibration. So... There is a front sight, which deals with your elevation, and then there's your rear sight that deals with the, the horizontal, the left and right. It's called windage. Front sight, elevation, rear sight, your horizontal, the, the windage. That'll preach itself, won't it? Right? So you have to make adjustments in your elevation based on your shot group, right? And then on the rear sight, you make adjustments, and then... You shoot, and then hopefully your shot group is tighter, and then it's time to qualify with your weapon, right? So first you got to zero your weapon, right? But the range control, when you get out there, you do not get live fire until they say, watch your lane, right? Did they say that in the Air Force? But that's what they say. They say, watch your lane. And that's what we're going to do tonight. We're going to watch our lane. And see, what happens is, if you, those targets are close together, right? Doc had talked about movement, and sometimes you do get the target. But though, if you do not pay particular attention to that target in front of you, you will shoot the target next to you. And when you come back, he's got 80, you've got zero. You're disqualified, and he's disqualified. You got to watch your lane. It does you absolutely no good to shoot in his lane, and it would do you absolutely no good to shoot with his weapon. So you got to watch your lane, right? So, and then, you know, when you're deployed and all this sort of thing, you would stack your weapons. I couldn't grab, my weapon is not your weapon. If I would grab the wrong weapon, that wasn't zeroed to the way I fired, the way I shoot, to the conditions in which my left eye's cocked and I shoot to the right. And uh, So I can't grab your weapon. My weapon isn't your weapon. We got the 7... I'm going to get to the 7M, but we got the 7M wrong. We got the 7M wrong. So anyway, watch your lane. Watch your lane. Watch your lane. I feel like... You know, this whole thing about, you know, this happened while we were sleeping, but we've also been pitching our tent towards Sodom. You know? I told you this wasn't going to be fun to preach. Genesis 13 says that he was pitching his tent towards Sodom. We're compromising. We're compromising. That's what it is. You know the thing about Daniel, the thing about Joseph, we talk about the three Hebrew boys. You know, we talk about Joseph and the, and the dreams and the interpretation and all this sort of thing. But what it really boils down to is they didn't compromise. They didn't compromise. 
they were surrounded in all these pagan societies with idolatry and all this foolishness going on. And at the end of the day, they didn't compromise. You know, we're so busy trying to climb the mountain, right? We're so busy trying to figure out where we fit on the mountain. Well, how selfish are you? Like, the Seven Mountain is about invading the culture. The Seven Mountain isn't necessarily all about you. That has its place. You have your assignment. But the se- we're supposed to be not compromising with the culture. We're supposed to be outside of these four walls, and we're supposed to be invading the culture that surrounds us. That's what infiltrating that's what, that's, what, that's what the 7M is all about. See, we're quick to say our identity is royalty, but we forget that our assignment is servanthood. All of us at the core, our assignment is servitude. That's what it is. Why are we so busy trying to get to the highest of places, I'm never going to be a principal. But I could rub elbows with people. Let me tell you something. When I worked in the government, when I worked in the government, I worked for a a senior executive service higher than GS-15. He was an SES, and SES has different levels, and this dude was the godfather of aviation. But guess who was really running the show? His secretary. His secretary was running everything. You couldn't get to see Mr. Shipley if you weren't on the calendar. You would have to wait to go to the bathroom to run into him before you would get his ear, before you get through that gate, which was the secretary. That was the, I mean, all the secretaries that I knew, that was the most powerful job in the military, in my government service, was that person, and, and more times than not, that if they did what they were supposed to do, that SES, that general, that GS-15, they were letting you do your schoolwork, getting your education while you were there, answering a few phone calls. But not all of us are called to be a principal for the education sphere. Shante O does that. She does that. But not all of us, we have to start. Let me tell you what I do. I gave, when I retired from the military, I had a great job. I had favor. I'm going to talk about favor later, but I had favor, man. They brought me back for a ridiculous amount of money, six figures doing stuff that I like to do anyway. And there came a certain point in time where I gave it all up. I was a program manager, man. I had a management of tens of hundreds of millions of dollars over all these kind of people. And I'm not bragging. I'm just telling you where I came from. But on my resume, the thing that I like doing most is I like going to Jersey Park three times a week and feeding people. That's what I do. That's what I do. And another thing that we're missing is we don't have to wear a Jesus button everywhere. We don't have to bump a G, put a you know bump a bumper sticker on our cars. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. There's something called covert where. You don't, I mean, that's the way we're going to infiltrate the world. If you come up with the Jesus, Jesus, Jesus stuff, where there's a time and place, you're going to scare people away. We're supposed to be invading the culture. We're supposed to be affecting them, but they're affecting us. How do I know? Look around. Look around you. This is backwards. This is not the way it should be for kingdom, you know, you know, the kingdom of God, uh, 7M, all this stuff is good. All this stuff has place. Even e- the religious mountain, just think about it. The Pope has probably a billion people, and the Pope just came out and said that I concur with same-sex marriages. Pope Francis, uh, I'm not saying anything about Catholicism, just follow the point. I'm going somewhere. He condoned same-sex marriages, and I'm here to tell you it's gone too far. This stuff that they're teaching in the schools happened while we were sleeping. And I'm giving you discreetly, if not discreetly, ways in which we're going to have to stand up, get on out of these four walls, and make a difference, and start affecting the culture around us, and not up in here in the Holy Ghost, in the tongues, and then leaving out of there and not doing anything. 
because I look to my left and I look to my right when I, you know, the enemy isn't out there doing push-ups waiting for us to go to the parking lot. Some of you brought the enemy in here. Me, you, he's in here. You know, and doing push-ups mean getting stronger. I'm not trying to be critical. I'm just saying. Like, it's comfortable in here. Come on, boom, I need some tonight. Come on, I know I don't have many amens. So, 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 it's serious, man. It's, this is for Gia, man. This is for Lonnie. It's time out. It's time out. You know, evolution. We talked about this in LEDs. Evolution. That we came from monkeys or share ancestries with apes. And they're teaching this in the schools, but it wasn't always like that. We were founded on Christ, Christian principles. I told you about prayer in school. And, you know, it, let, me just, let me just hit this briefly. 1925, the Scopes trial. This is a lads thing, right? And, but it's, it, it's important to know. And what happened was they were te there was a Butler Law in Tennessee. This happened in Dayton, Tennessee, and there's something called the Butler Law. And the Butler Law said that you could not teach anything aside from creation. Right. And so what they did was the ACLU, they found a, a guinea pig, if you will, named John T. Scopes. And he was basically a high school football coach. And and he had been a substitute teacher for biology. And did you ever teach evolution? Yeah. All right. Will you go to court? He wasn't married. He was like, whatever. All right. I'll go to court. And so it was the state of Tennessee, right, saying that this, this John T. Scopes violated the Butler Law and was teaching evolution. This is 1925. Darwin had long been dead, but evolution was still being taught in the schools. So what you had was Clarence Darrow for the defense for the ACLU, and then we had William Jennings Bryant as the plaintiff, as the lawyer for the plaintiff. And this thing, I'm telling you, was prejudicial from the beginning. John T. Scopes was guilty of teaching evolution in schools. Case closed. The judge was a man of God. The judge says, I've been ordained by God as a time like this. The jury, out of the 12, 11 were saved, either Methodist or Baptist, one agnostic. But this case was open and shut. Before it even started, he was going to be guilty. But what happened was, is the judge would not let three scientists who uh, the ACLU brought in to testify in evolution and all this sort of thing, and the judge said, nope, we're not going to let you testify because this has, nothing to do with, it, this has nothing to do with evolution. All this has to do is, is with... Um, oh, good, the clock didn't start. All this has to do with um, the, uh, the teaching of evolution. He violated it, and so that's a wrap. Well, what happened was after seven days, the, the plaintiffs rested, and they didn't let the three participate, right? So Darrow and this William Jennings Bryant were kind of buddies on the side, but they always were one up in each other. So he said, hey, can I call William Jennings Bryant up to defend the faith? And the judge said, well, I'm not going to make him, but if he wants to, go ahead. So he says, yeah. He was a great orator. He presented his case. It was a killer case. I mean, this courthouse was full. You talk about the case of the century. Before the case of the century, this was the case of the century. Everybody was there. 200 news stations. This was before, you know, they allowed cameras in there. Radios were in there. This was a big deal. So he gets on the stand because he said he'd do it. And this is, this is where it all went wrong. So he put his hands on the Bible. He was sworn in, and he said, this is Clarence Darrow, he, William Jennings Bryan. He said, uh, so you believe in a literal interpretation of the Bible, right? He said, by God, I do. And then you could just see it coming, right? So he said, so you believe that Jonah was in the belly of a whale for three days and three nights? He said, well, first, so William Jennings Bryan said, well, first of all, it wasn't a whale, the Bible said it was a fish. And he said, well, in the New Testament, they say well, don't they? And William Bryan said, I don't know. I don't recall. But it does say well in the New Testament, doesn't it? He said, I don't know, I don't recall, but I stand on the word of God, and I believe that for three days, three nights, he stayed in the belly of a fish, well, whatever. 
And it just went downhill from there. If Cain, you know, if Adam's kids were such and such and such and such, and he just, you remember when you talked about uh, Dr. Creflo Dollar and somebody stood up and just started like, nah, 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 if the, nah, nah, nah. And finally he said, look, isn't Jesus enough? Like, is Jesus enough? And see, the devil will, he knows the word, so he's going to try to trap you. And that's what I see all around us these days is like, we're just getting like trapped into the, into the word. First of all, you got to know the word. But second of all, just don't bow down to the foolishness because they are right. They know what contradictions they're going to come at you with. So what I say, I was at Barnes and Nobles and there was this guy, I was in the Christian book section and he said, hey man, he said, uh, what day do you go to church? I said, Sunday. And he said, well, you know that, that the Sabbath is really Saturday. And I said, hey, man, Jesus is enough for me. <laughs> you're, you're, that's it. That's how you close that down. Jesus is enough for me. What about the other 1,700 Levitical laws that you just broke? So I, I, I don't even play with them. Like, I don't even play because it, you know, it, it was a setup. So God's telling us to watch our lane. If, you're, if you ever fly on an aircraft and you go above about 14,000 feet and there's a rapid decrease in pressure, right? The oxygen mass is going to come down. And if you listen to what they say, what do they say? That's what we're doing tonight. Before we can help others, we're putting on, we're putting on ours first. You know, the literal, the, the literal interpretation of the Bible is, is not something, you know, you, you have to be led by the Spirit of God. You know, we, you know I'm a studier of the Bible. You've got to study to show that stuff to prove down to God. That's important. And this, this scripture that I read you, I'm, I'm, I'm going to bring you some revelation. It's going to blow your mind. And it's going to be the litmus test. You say, well, how do we watch? How do we examine ourselves? I'm going to show you. I'm going to walk you right through it. I got some practical examples. I got some scriptures if you want. But I'm going to show you what the Bible says about it. God showed this to me. It blew my mind. But we've got to be able to discern spiritual truths like in the same sentence that the bible says you shall lay hands on people and cast out demons it also says that thou shalt take up serpents but there's people in west virginia that are worshiping with with cert like is that what they really meant by take up serpents is that what they really meant by drink poison no that's why you got the spirit of god to be able to discern the scriptures, but it starts by getting into the scripture. You know, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, therefore, what does it say? He is a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. All, we, there should be a marked difference in us and the world, right? Amen. Right? We should be different. We, 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 for, we forget. This is, this is the test. Even in leads, I believe you use the scripture as a test. You want to know where you are? Are you different? If you, if you want to become a butterfly, you got to give up your caterpillar ways. Right? You got to work out your own salvation. Work out your own salvation. Wow, 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 wow. I do have a few notes that I want to talk about. Creflo Dollar said, and, you know, the kingdom of God, this, this, this is as simple as it gets. The kingdom of God is God's way of doing business. That's it. That's the kingdom. The kingdom of God is God's way of doing business. And if you look around us in today's culture, is this God's business? Is this the way God does business? So how can, we, how can we impact that? Serve, right? You, you kind of got to know what your assignment is. I'm not taking that away from 7M, but it's really about serving. You know, they, uh, Minister Lewis was talking about uh, when they ate and they had leftover food, they said there's people starving in Africa. But, you know, in, in the first seven months of this year, I know for a fact 
that we have fed 10,000 people in Smithfield alone. 10,000 in Smithfield alone. That's about 3,500 families. And I told you my resume is big and it would look puffy on paper, but my greatest achievement, I promise you, is ministering. See, I don't do it overtly. I do it covertly. My opportunity to minister is bringing food to the car, and then that's when I hit them. But I only do it if they ask me, if they ask me questions. My tattoos, say what you will about my tattoos, you don't know how much this ministers. It brings, lay, it brings people into tears, and it's an opportunity to minister. I was on vacation with my niece. Everywhere I went, we were on the beach. I had on my, my thing, my muscle shirt, whatever, whatever. People were stopping me. You know, hey. I like that tribe of Judah. He said, uh, you know, I'm a minister down in North Carolina, small church. What do you know about the tribe of Judah? The lion. Da 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 da. Opportunity to minister. Yeah. I could not get people to stop coming up to me and 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 they minister. But I don't do it overtly. I'm not, I don't slap a Jesus button. Yeah, I got my tattoos, but I people approach me and I minister it. And I minister it. The toughest thing, my, my dad, right? Oh, man, I am seriously. My dad went from a CPA, right, to the president and the CEO of a company. And he's retired now. They're flying him in. He's, he's 80 years old. They're flying him into a board meeting next month, and I think I'll get the opportunity to see him the week after. But he's kind of a big deal, right? He was the first one out of the family lineage to actually, you know, be the CEO and president of the company. And he always sits me down and he always says, Jeff, 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 Jeff. And I just dismiss it like, oh, yeah, Dad, I heard this a hundred times before. Jeff, Jeff, Jeff. What I had to do, I had to go down there and change the culture. And that thing didn't hit me until I was preparing for this message. Like, I've been dismissing this like, Dad, 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 Dad. It didn't matter, his knowledge of the company, his financial, the backing, his leadership skills. He said, I had to change the culture. I had to change the culture. I can't believe I'm going to zero out and I haven't even started my message. So, so here's the thing. So I, I gotta, I've got so much I want to say, but here's the thing. Here's the thing. Examine ourselves and, and you're going to say, what's, what's the test? What's the test? I know we got to examine ourselves. I know you're telling me to watch our lane, but what's the test? Matthew 4. Matthew 4 is the test. Matthew 4 is the test. Let me read it. I got so much I want to say, and we got to hurry up. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. I want you to take note of be tempted. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward hungry. And when the tempter came to him, he said, if thou be the son of God, command these stones and be made to bread. I'm going to stop there for the expense of time. But what I didn't tell you is the first scripture I read about examine ourselves. It's important for you to know the Greek word, not to sound smart. Parasso, if I'm saying it right, is examine yourself. Parasso. Well, guess what? Well, I just read in Matthew 4, the litmus test for our own introspection says, then Jesus was led up by the spirit of the wilderness to be tempted. That's the same Greek word, perasso, to be tempted. So same thing right here. Let me tell you guys, I don't care what Bible you use, but this is the Hebrew Greek. I encourage you to start with a lexicon because you need to know these things. You need to know the original Hebrew and Greek and Aramaic that was used and for your edification so the spirit can agree with your spirit when it gets in there. That's important that we know right here that this temptation that Jesus went through is the same test that Paul said, examine yourselves. Even the te examine yourselves. So what did, what, what happened in the wilderness? First, it was take, take these stones and make it into bread, right? So he attacked the physical part of man, right? The physical, right? The second 
is go to the highest in Jerusalem and jump off, and then he misapplied Psalm 91 and say the angels, right? He misapplied. So what was he after there? The emotional, the security part. And then the third test was of psychological, right? Of power and superiority and esteem, right? And so that is the beginning. I have a, and maybe I'll share it online, I have a bunch of other tests that we can do to examine ourselves, but in essence, that's the test. If you want to find out where, where you are and watch your lane, I tell you, you know, he was fasting, but the enemy tries to get you when you're hungry, when you're angry, when you're lonely, and when you're tired. That's when he's going to get you. And that's where the real test is. And if, if, you, if you would go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and read about love and go through all those scriptures starting at 4, and if you want to test where you're at, test where you are in though all those areas that follow charity, which means love, are you patient? Are you this? Are you that? Are you... Th and, and that'll be the test. I'm telling you, saints, in order to make it through this world, you have to have favor. You have to have favor. Favor is, Elisha is a good example of favor, right? Second Kings chapter 4, somewhere around the ninth verse, Elisha went to the Shunam and the Shunamite woman, and she said, she was, she was telling her husband, I perceive that he is a man of God. That's nothing but favor. That's nothing but favor. What took Hadassah, an orphan Jewish girl, to be the queen? Favor. And she wasn't overt about it. Matter of fact, you could argue that she had to conceal her faith. When they took her, she had to conceal her faith to get to where she was. And Mordecai, her cousin, because it was his uncle's daughter, but she was an orphan, so he raised her, so his father, you know, followed the concept. But he failed to bow to Haman. Again, going back to not compromising. Not compromising the word of God. Saints, we got to watch our lane, man. It's not a fun message to preach, man. But I'm telling you, God had a word for his people. I'm telling you, if you feel like somebody can handle this word and somebody that wants to affect culture, you know, I encourage you to, to share this message. Uh, man, I was on vacation last week and the spirit of God came over me and the anointing was on me so heavy that I was on the ground crying. And it was prophetic. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this because God is yanking at me to do this. I wanted to do it in the hallway, but Cheryl, please stand up. Stand up. So, you know, sometimes God changes people's names, right? Saul, Paul, Jacob. Israel, but even after the name change, God went back and said, the God of Jacob, right? His name had been changed to Israel. So I don't know why God's saying this, but, and he said to address Renee, and I don't know what that means. I know you're a minister. I know you're Cheryl Streeter. I know what you're called to do, but God has a word for you, and he, he said it's, it's for Renee. It's for Renee. And what he's saying falls along the lines of the vengeance, right? Vengeance and recompense. And what he showed me was there's going to be a dramatic and a radical reversal of fortune in your life. That's vengeance. That's vengeance. And the reason why he's telling me to tell you it's Renee is because he doesn't want you to forget where you came from. And he didn't use the word fortune as in fortune teller. He used fortune, a, a dramatic and a radical reversal of fortune. He's talking about destiny. He's talking about abundance. 
He's talking about blessings and he's talking about success. And he wants you, when it happens, he wants you to tell it. He wants you to tell it and he doesn't want you to forget where you came from. The devil has thrown everything he can at you and yet you stand. And yet you stand. He had me on the floor for you, Cheryl. He had me on the floor for you, Renee. Oh, my God. Hallelujah. He had me on the floor. Well, praise the Lord. I had so much more I wanted to say. Our time is short. I pray that this was edifying. I didn't want to preach this message. God told me I had to. He told, he told me I had to preach it. And guess what? Guess what? Guess what the Bible says? The Bible says, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you three, uh, free. John 8, 32. So I want you, and I know you guys know, and I want the audience out there to know that you have a right to be free. You have a right to be free. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So that concludes my message. What I'm going to do is I'm going to end it in this way. The Bible says in Romans 10 and 9 that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thy heart that God has raised you from the dead, thou shalt be saved. And therefore you can enter into the kingdom of God. And don't be fooled. When you are saved, your spirit is made afresh. It's brand new. Your spirit has been perfected. It's been sealed. It's been perfected forever. It cannot escape. It's in there. We are wall-to-wall -wall God. That spirit, that spirit filled living in leads. One-on-one, spirit filled living. So you have a right to be free tonight. If you said that, and if you accept Christ as your personal Savior, we welcome you into the kingdom, and we welcome you to start doing business God's way. Praise the Lord. Stand to your feet. Hallelujah. Man, I don't even think I started my message. Part two next month. Amen. We have to finish it next month. We have prayer next week. And then uh, we haven't done the, so not next week because we have prayer, but the following Wednesday, I'll finish this message. Amen. Okay. All right. Praise the Lord.